Can you t- can you talk about how the first time that you met Fela Kuti? Uh, well, we met. We met. We, we corresponded with Fela. So by the time uh, uh, I I met Kuti, uh, he had arranged for me to come and stay with him in uh, Nigeria because I was looking to put together an African band. I had been in the States for 12 years. I felt I had peaked and I couldn't go to Southern Africa. So uh, um, somebody got us uh, uh, together, you know, by mail and gave me his address. And I, I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, just come on over, man. And like, uh, we play with the band every night at the shrine except Mondays, and uh, we'll hang out, and then I'm going on a tour of, of West Africa, and in every town, there'll be a, an opening band. And the first, the place we, we went to on that tour was Accra in Ghana, and the band that opened Hedge of the Sounds uh, uh, just blew me away, and I stayed there. And uh, by then, I mean, we, so when I met with Stella, we were like, we're old friends, because we shared the same kind of, uh, uh, I think uh, the same kind of uh, feelings about authority and, and uh, you know, corruption and um, all the bullshit that goes on in politics. Uh, but he was also like a very funny guy, and I like to laugh myself. So <laughs> it was like a long lost twin. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, 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 th- to me, Hugh, it, like, uh, what were you? I mean, I listened to those albums uh, in the Shrine, Hezel of Sounds. Uh, did you? Yeah, Hezel of Sounds is the group. That's a group that I uh, 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 I went on to make. I think four more albums with them were great success. But that's the, that's, that's the group that opened for Fela in, in in Ghana when I went with it. You well, I mean, when Louis, when when Louis Armstrong and them started playing uh, in in New Orleans, there were no schools. You know, we just played together, and you learned on the job. Sure, and in Af and, and in Africa, you know, and and uh, and and uh, it was the same. You know, we learned by we did everything by ear. And some of us learned how to read, and we had big bands and stuff like that. But um, we all we were all self-taught musicians, and we were taught by older musicians. We were taught by older musicians who probably had taught themselves. You know, uh, you must remember that. Um, uh, 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 Dixie Land and all those guys, they came out of like military bands and army bands, you know, and uh, the, the, the same thing happened in Africa. People came out of Salvation Army bands uh, and uh, uh, um, street marching bands. <laughs> and um, uh, you just progress, you know, they come, people come up with new stuff and they say it's new, but I believe everything is is, is, is is being recycled a million times. Can you talk about as a young boy, because you could not access a book, and like you said, you're not an intellectual mus- musician. Can you talk about going to? An I could have accessed it, but I was I, I could have accessed it. I mean, I started my first uh, my first instrument was a piano. I, I started when I was five, and I did Chopin and Beethoven and Bach and Liszt and. Uh, and the sati and all those, you know, they were in the books. You can read it, read piano teachers and all that. But I was a little bit ahead of myself with everything. I wanted to know more, 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 more. And uh, that, I think that's how I ended in the States, because I wanted to have access to the teachers in the States. But uh, even when I got there, I found that there was no way you could really like, uh, learn bebop. It's either you were with it or not, or you understood it or not, but uh, some of the people had the dexterity and understanding for it. And then uh, I just was a, a sponge for music, so I went to a music school that was a, a, a classical school, for, you know, but like... Um, it depends on your passion and hunger for, for stuff. If you, if you really want it, you learn it first. You want to talk? A little talent helps, of course. Oh, well, I mean, of course. I mean, we're talking to Hugh Masakela, but uh, I, I, my question that I was trying to ask you is the first time that you went to an elder to seek knowledge. In today's world, younger generations access stuff. There are so many books. There's all this flood of information. It is the YouTube generation. Hugh Masakela did not have that. Can you talk, give us, talk about a story when you went to an elder, an African tribe elder, and sought information from them. This is about totally about communication. Um, 
I never went to look for for um, wisdom or whatever it is. It was always there. We were raised by our grandparents, you know, and we we, we were raised in the traditional. When I grew up in the thirties and forties, we were raised um, uh, um, we were raised traditionally. You know, we had to go and learn how to milk cows. We had to go and learn how to like the herd boys and do the, you know the traditional stuff. But at the same time, we had access to like um, a Western education, and we took it all in. Can you talk about the first time in New York when Dizzy Gillespie took, call, uh, called you up to the stage? But Dizzy Gillespie was one of the people who helped me come to America. How did he help you? You know. How did he help you? Well, he well he uh, went and spoke to the people at the Manhattan School of Music, and they recommended. He was very tight with Miriam Makeba and Harry Belafonte, who were the ones who brought me to school. But uh, they didn't know those places, so Dizzy was one of the people. And I I started corresponding with Dizzy more than a year before that, because Miriam had put us together. But you know, uh, I I was never really starstruck. You know, because I grew up in music, and uh, I think that what guides you when you're in music is um, is enthusiasm and passion. And when you meet somebody like Dizzy, you're happy, but you don't jump all over them. You know, you just have to, to make contact and to see, uh, uh, to see, uh, um, you know, how much uh, you can uh, consolidate the, uh, um, their belief in you. You can't take a picture of me without asking me. And it was much later that I, that I got to play with Dizzy, in, you know, in, in, at a club or wherever he was playing. But the first time I met Dizzy, he didn't bring me on stage. Right, no. He was, to come. he was playing opposite Monk, and I had just landed. So, I mean, hey, I was just happy to be there. But I'll tell you a funny story. This the billionaire guy uh, uh, in... Uh, in uh, uh, California, um, I gave away all his billions to charity, to hunger, but he bought himself a Bugatti for two million pounds and he prayed to God, to say, God, if you can just build me a highway from here to Hawaii, when I get to Hawaii, I'll even give this Bugatti away. He just, and God said to him, well, don't you have anything easier you can think about, you know, and he said, uh, because I can't, I can't build a highway. Uh, uh, so I said, "Okay, God, can you do me a favor? Can you help me to understand women?" And he said, to, uh, "And then God said to him, uh, was that a two-lane or a four-lane highway you wanted?'" <laughs> do you get my drift? Uh huh. Sure. <laughs> sure. That, that's how much I know about love, too. You know. <laughs> I know nothing about love except what I experienced personally, but what you experienced personally, you can't generalize to people. Uh, what happened uh, at this International Jazz Day with Barack and Michelle Obama? What was your takeaway from that? I don't know. I can only talk to you about it after it, it happened, you know, but we've, this is the fifth. This is the sixth UN International Day we're doing. You know, we've done it in Paris, in New York, in Istanbul, in Japan. And uh, um, uh, it's an invited audience, and it's more or less the same musicians. You know, and we all play together. We all play one song together. And I'm going there just to, like, make the audience and uh, 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 feel good just like anybody else. And whatever else comes out of there, I guess will be common knowledge, right? So I'm getting. But I've been play, I've been play I've been playing all my life, you know, in 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 in, in many low places and high places, and I think that the only thing you can um, uh, get out of playing anyway is if the people are happy, then you are happy, you know. So if Michelle and Barack are gonna enjoy what we do for them, that's all you can hope for. I, I come. I come from a background of of. Uh, I grew up. We all grew up in South Africa in rallies and marches and strikes, and massacres and stuff like that. So 
if we're going to sing about things, it would be difficult not to sing about what happened to us. You know, you grew up when you were two, three years old, you knew that you were black and that you were oppressed. How? You know what I how, mean? Did you, how did you know that? Because it was the law. <laughs> it was the law was everywhere. When cops raided, when you're two, three years old and cops are raiding, uh, uh, and you see uh, um, uh, your grandparents or your parents or the neighbors being harassed, how can't you know? Because it's happening there publicly in the streets when hundreds of people are shot at or they're arrested and you watch them being marched up and down the street. It's, it's right there in front of you. You know, it's not like a romantic experience. It's a thing that happens around the corner and you live your, your life and every day and every hour with everybody in your communities to beat the system. Uh, Fela, Fela's mother was thrown out of a third story window. Did, your, did you have any family members that were, that were killed? I didn't have to witness them being getting killed, but I got the news that they were killed uh, is no different from uh, witnessing them. You know, but I've seen other people getting shot that I didn't know. So it doesn't have, uh, you know, when you're oppressed, you're all family. What do you think the conditions, I mean, talked as an ignorant uh, 38-year-old journalist in Tucson, Arizona, can you just talk to the world about the current conditions in where you live in South Africa, in uh, Cape Town? I mean, it has, ha, ha, what has improved and what is still absolutely not acceptable? Well, I can just tell you one thing, my friend. You know, that once people grow up bigoted, you know, or uh, people grow up prejudiced, and in every society all over the world, there's prejudice, there's racism, and uh, you know, there's xenophobia. And when people grow up like that, you'll never be able to change them. I think the United States is the greatest example of that, in that after um, all these emancipations and civil rights and all that, I think last year and the year before, uh, was a year when like a whole lot of people came out to show that they hadn't changed, that they hated Af uh, people of African American origin and they're going to kill them. And that happens all over the world. And I didn't expect, when I came back to South Africa, my home, I didn't expect miracles. I don't think you can change people overnight. In fact, I don't even believe that you can change people. I think sometimes it's, it's, it's just like uh, it's flowing in their veins. Right, right. I mean, I think it's just really important for somebody that expresses themselves through their instrument. Uh, you know, you've seen and also heard and just seen so much injustice. Um, can you talk about your relationship with uh, the late, great Nelson Mandela? I didn't have a relationship with Vanessa Mandela. I just knew him. I knew him from when I was a kid uh, uh, because William Mandela trained under my mother as a social worker. And my sister was his chief of staff when he came out of jail and until he became president. But um, um, I only saw him when I took her to him, you know, or if we were performing for him. But it was always a hi, hello, how are you, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you'd be able to like sit around and he'd tell a story or two, but I didn't have a close relationship with him. But you did write Bring Him Back Home. That was in honor of him, is that correct? I'll tell you something. The freedom uh, uh, of South Africa uh, was created, whatever freedoms we got, was created by the ordinary person in the street. And the fact that they never get any uh, credit for it, they really, like... Um, breaks me, but in everything that happens, you know, people try to, like, um, build heroes out of that struggle, you know, but um, uh, the, the struggle of African Americans in the United States has a lot of matters, but a lot of them are unknown, you know, and freedom is one t terrain that is just, like, is full of unknown matters, but, like, uh, the press, the media, and whoever is in power at the time makes up the heroes. I completely agree with you, and I'd love you to give an example of, of one of these street people that was a hero, people's history of martyrdom. Give an example. 
Well, there was hundreds. Hundreds of people were massacred, you know, in South Africa. And hundreds of people were have been massacred all over the world. Well, I don't live in a world where I look for individuals, you know. I don't like I don't like the lionizing of people. But when I think of them, uh, you know, thousands of students that were killed in like uh, in uh, the 1976 uh, uprisings in South Africa, or like uh, the 69 people who were killed, most of them shot back in uh, Shotdale, or the people who were killed. Uh, uh, in, in, in the SARS in the States in the 1950s and 60s and the four children who were bombed and killed in the church. It's all over, man, you know. And, uh, uh, and the 30 million uh, uh, people who uh, probably died in the Atlantic crossing when, uh, in uh, the recruiting of slaves, uh, it's just endless. And when you get into the wars that, like, if you look at human beings and the history of human beings, we've always been at each other's throats. And like, um, uh, there's no more parasitical species than human beings. Tell me a little bit about how the first sounds of jazz that you heard on the radio free uh, radio growing up. And who did you listen to? Well, we listened to everybody because we had gramophones. Everybody had a gramophone. Mm-hmm. And we listened to everybody from Louis Armstrong to King Oliver and Jesse Smith and Matt Rainey and uh, Jerry Martin and Basie and uh, Duke and Jimmy Lunsford and uh, Billy Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald and uh, uh, it's endless, you know. Uh, ben Miller and the Desi brothers, Woody Hammond, Betty Goodman. Um, it's just endless. We were walking encyclopedias of music. Did you? I mean, by the time I came to the States, there was nothing I didn't know about America. But were you, um, did you believe, I mean, you mentioned uh, Benny Goodman and Jimmy Lunsford, but did you, uh, was your perception that, that the, the black artists, the, the Ellingtons and uh, the Charlie Parkers, were well recognized and were treated with respect in the United States. Was that your impression when you came here? Because obviously, I mean, you know, there. I wasn't that naive, man. I wasn't that naive. You know, that uh, uh, you're asking me a question, but I wasn't that naive. I knew I knew the history of America when I came to America. I had been in high school. Where in geography, where to draw the map of America, where to draw the rivers, where to draw the 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 where to uh, show where the products came from and and, and the, the hinterlands and the exports and the you know I was highly educated. Sure, sure. No, this is great. So you you because there were cats from Europe uh, who would come over here and they idolized cats like McCoy Tyner and they'd go see him at the village gate and there were ten people there. So, I mean, Charles Lloyd, when I talked to him, at U, when he went to USC, there was absolutely no adherence to Duke Ellington or Charlie Parker or any of the black heroes of the music. But you were not naive. So you knew coming over here that you were going to create seminal Afro music and it was already going to... No, 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 no. I came to the United States to have the opportunity to learn things that I couldn't, like, um, access learning to in South Africa. And, of course, the best, you know, the best musicians that come out of America, so to have access to their teachers, was it. Yeah, that was going to come over and um, um, go to music school and come back to South Africa and teach. But by the time I finished music school, it was too, uh, I had said too much and I couldn't return to South Africa. So I stayed an extra 26 years. Can you talk about the club or the where you, uh, in Africa where you you were able to woodshed on the bandstand to develop that sound? It doesn't magically come as you know. You came to the states with your individual sound. What? Where was the club and what was the? Band? I grew up in dance in South Africa. I grew up in dance bands. You know, all night dance bands. We played township dance music. It was South African. It was a mixture of everything that you know. Well, you know, I mean, grazing in the grass is typical South African dance music. 
Sure. No, I'm talking about 2016, Hugh. I'm, I'm talking about where we're at now in this country is that you played Whiskey A Go-Go with, you know, uh, you know, uh, Al Abreu, rest in peace, Henry the Skipper Franklin. You played, that was a bar. You played there six nights a week, three weeks at a time. There's one jazz club left in Los Angeles. Do you understand? There's no pl- there's no venues to play. When you came here, you yeah, were- but I don't I don't I don't go I don't go around the world flying a jazz flag. You know, I'm right. a musician. Sure, sure. I'm just saying. But that- I'm not I'm not a, I, I, I'm not a jazz musician. I'm just a musician. Totally. The fact that maybe the jazz in my music is like a. And then the music I play is coincidental, but it's because I learned from jazz people and I learned from jazz music, among other things. But I went to uh, Manhattan School of Music, which is a classical school of music, you know, and I learned, like, European music. And um, I learned bebop in the streets, really. Exactly.